Well, here we are, reproduction two. We're going to be talking about testicular histology. You remember histology means the study of tissue, and it's usually under the light microscope. Light microscopes can do up to about a thousand power magnification. I do want to introduce a couple things before we go to see microscopic images. Obviously, this is not microscopic image. These are actually two testicles, I believe, out of a ram. That's a male sheep. But I did want to talk about several things here before I go on to histology. First of all, this structure here that supports, that comes out of the body, I guess I should say, and supplies all the vessels to the testes. It's called the spermatic cord. I'll put that over here so that black won't show up. But the spermatic cord is this whole thing. And if you did a transverse section, you would see the artery coming down. That's in red in this picture. You don't see the veins going back up. There's nerves. And then, of course, there's a vast deferens in there, too, that's going to carry sperm from the testes, epididymis, all the way up. Now, there is a blood network um, there, and it's actually called a panpiniform plexus. And the plexus is really the venous network. And so this blood coming out of the body is too warm, actually, for the testes to function normally. So the panpiniform plexus is really a heat exchange where cooler venous blood picks up heat coming out of the arterial supply. Okay, that's one point I wanted to make. Maybe I'll refresh your memory. This is the epididymis. I'm looking on the left testis here and drawing or dragging my laser pointer. The head of the epididymis, the body. I'm on the left diagram now, left picture. And then this bulb-like structure. That's always the tail of the epididymis. So if you look at these two testes out of the same animal, you would say that, man, they're very uniform in size. And that's usually the case. In a normal animal, the left testis and the right testis should be about equal. They're never going to be perfectly equal in weight, but very close. And then I remember doing studies in swine, or boars, maybe I should say. And we took a sample out of, like, the top third. I've got my laser pointer going. The top third the middle third and the bottom third, and we looked at what was going on histologically speaking, like the size of the seminiferous tubule and stuff, which we'll point out here in a little bit. And there was no regional differences, or there should say there were no regional differences. So whatever the testes is doing up on the top, it's doing in the middle, and it's doing in the bottom. And then we also looked at uh, other people have done this. I didn't. But other people have looked at one testis versus the other. And they're pretty uniform in development. So if sperm production is going full-fledged over on the left, it's also going full-fledged on the right. Okay, we're ready to do a little histology. I'm going to show this picture again, probably not enlarge it as much. But the image I'm going to show you in next is a transverse section or a transverse cut and I want to show you how to look at that. Look at the left testis. Watch my red laser pointer. If you cut a testis like that, you would agree that you'd get a lot of the testis but you'd also see some of the epididymis and whatever blood vessels are in that plane. And that's what I want to show you next is a transverse section through the testis but there's also part of the epididymis there. And here we go. Uh, whenever you see H and E, that's hematoxylin and eosin. That's a very famous stain. And this is very low power. I mean, maybe it's 10 or 20, 30 power, very low. Here's the epididymis, always on the outside of the testis. And we're actually seeing some nice transverse sections of the tube. The epididymis, remember the epididymis is storing sperm, not making sperm. And maybe I can enlarge it even a little more and 
point out some things. Okay, so here's an artery. Notice how it's almost still round and there's some red blood cells in there. Veins tend to be thinner walled and they get a little maybe crushed or they're not going to retain their perfect circle. Okay, so this is a very nice picture it's a very like a bird's eye view and there's really lobules in the testes compartments I call them so it's really like imagining a garden hose think of a long garden hose and then there's a room and you shove the garden hose into that room and then there's a room next to it and you shove another garden hose into that room and the garden hoses are what we're going to find out are called seminiferous tubules and they're all making sperm, okay? But there are walls, septa. And so that's a very nice picture. I'm going to put that over here. And again, I just want to drag this up and say, remember, the epididymis is out there. Outside of the testis, we're going to get a higher magnification shortly. Okay, now we're ready to look at a higher magnification. And although this is, doesn't state it, I'm going to bet a lot of money that is, this is a rat testis, a section of rat testis. And I'll tell you why I think that is. Let me orientate you. The perfect round structures are seminiferous tubules. And I'm going to show you later why they don't have to be perfectly round. It depends on the section of the cut. But every time I've worked with rat testicular tissue and when you process it and we won't get into it but there's a lot of processing that goes into making a thin slice and then you look at it under the microscope after you've stained it with this is probably an H and E stain the seminiferous tubules shrink look at and you might think oh is there air in the testis no in the natural state before this was stained and fixed you would not see any of that white area but for some reason that i've found at least the rat testicular tissue shrinks a lot and then you would call that an artifact so it's an artifact that this space is here see these cells over here near this eye which means interstitial cells we'll talk about those in a minute they would be right next to that seminiferous tubule a couple other things look at this artery stays very round here's another artery here's another one here's probably a vein there's lymph tissue out there as well so here's the take-home lesson any vessel blood vessel or lymph vessel is always extra tubular extra tubular extra tubular you'll never find blood vessels inside a seminiferous tubule so down here on the legend, S is a seminiferous tubule. There's one. Perfect cross-section, which means it's a perfect transverse section of a tube. Think of a garden hose. You cut it perpendicular to the long axis, and you would see the inside, the lumen, right, of a garden hose. I is the interstitial cells. That's out here. Interstitial cells are also called Leydig cells. So look at the bottom of the screen. Interstitial cells equal Leydig cells. And they're the ones that make testosterone. We're going to have some higher magnifications later, but these are great. And then one last point about this slide. I know the male that this was taken from was past puberty, because here it is. When there's a lumen in the seminiferous tubule, the animal has reached puberty and is actively making sperm. If these were kind of solid tissue, and I couldn't find one right now, but if they were solid tissue without a defined lumen, you would say the male was prepuberal because sperm production not, does not take place until puberty. The tubes themselves grow, and I've done studies where we measured the diameter and they grow all the way from birth to puberty, and then they actually grow in diameter after puberty, but the lumen never appears until sperm production is uh, full-fledged. Okay, 
and you know my feeling about the more sections you look at the more you learn because any one section of let's say testicular tissue or one picture of you name the organ doesn't tell you everything so let's look at this this one's a little blurry but it's got a couple things that i want to point out okay tubules those are the seminiferous tubules first of all you can say oh the male has reached puberty because there are lumen in the tubes a lot of them are perfectly cross section now they're calling these Leydig cell clusters. Yes, they tend to be in clusters. They're always going to be extra tubular. But this slide brings up a new point, tangentially sectioned tubule epithelium. That means it's not a perfect cross section. And I want to talk about that. So you might see a seminiferous tubule that's like really oblong shape or something weird. And I want to say or show you how you can get that. So let me draw a tube and it's like a garden hose think of a garden hose right there okay now I'm gonna change my color and let's say I want to do a transverse section you know that's perpendicular to the long axis right so let me do perpendicular to the long axis there I just made a transverse section of that seminiferous tubule, and if I looked at the cross end, which is what you're looking at up here, I'm up in the very top left, then you would get a perfect lumen and round structure. But imagine if it was tangential, as that slide said, I call it oblique. If you cut something at an oblique angle, look at what you get. And if I had to draw that, then on a slide, it would look kind of like this, okay? There's the lumen right there, okay? So this is what you get from that. This is what you get from that. So histology is interesting. You can't cut all the tubes perfect because they're like shoving a garden hose in a, like, let's say a box, not a room. But a big box the garden hose is all over the place so sometimes when you make a cut the tubes will be perfectly cut transverse section and then there's all kinds of oblique angles that will occur and so got to be aware of that in histology makes it very interesting now finally i want to compare a real high power of a seminiferous tubule with another photomicrograph you call these things of the epididymis so if you ever see these two side by side you can tell which one is testicular and which one is epididymal now remember the testes are very complicated they're making sperm and the epididymis isn't that complicated it's going to concentrate the sperm help them mature but it's not making sperm so let's look at this Okay, and it brings up the Sertoli cell, which I want to talk about too. So let me get my laser pointer going. Laser pointer going. Here's the lumen. And then remember, these are fixed and stained, and there's all kinds of washing going on. So there might have been sperm in the lumen here. And sometimes you see them floating in the middle with tails. In this case, we don't, but let me orientate you. Okay. So here I'm going to circle the seminiferous tubule. You can call this a basement membrane. Remember, inside the tubule, you will never find blood vessels, lymph vessels, whatever, nothing except the tubule. Then the sperm, when they first start out, are very small, round cells, like primary spermatocytes. There's all kinds of stages, but as they develop, they go from the basement membrane towards the lumen. And one of the last stages is spermatids. And see how they say early spermatids because the cell is still round. But then late spermatids start getting the typical sperm head. They're not going to be perfectly round. Anyway, it's not till this point where they 
develop their tail. And then I always say when they jump off into the lumen, they yell bonsai. It's a little joke of mine, I guess. Anyway, Sertoli cells, I'm down here, are hard to show because they're very convoluted, they're very weird in their structure, but Sertoli cells are the nurse cells for the sperm. They provide a lot of support for those round cells as they start their journey down towards the lumen. And the interesting thing is, let's say right above the Sertoli cell label, that's a Leydig cell. Remember, Leydig cells are out here, interstitial cells, they're also called, right? Well, lo and behold, they make testosterone. And you can look at the endocrine section if you want to review that, but they make testosterone and some of the testosterone diffuses across the basement membrane into the seminiferous tubule and lo and behold, the Sertoli cell takes that testosterone and makes estradiol 17 beta, which is very interesting. So the seminiferous tubule, in particular the Sertoli cell, makes estradiol 17 beta that helps sperm production and it supposedly helps the function of the epididymis. Now, let me scale that one back a little bit and bring in a picture of a perfect transverse section of an epididymis. And I want you to see these side by side because look at over here on the right. Look at how clean that looks. Columnar cells with cilia. There would be sperm in here. Why aren't there sperm? Is because they got washed out in the processing. But this is the epididymis. You don't find Sertoli cells in the epididymis. You don't find Leydig cells out here. You find this nice tubular structure that's going to have sperm in it, and it's going to have this, it's a storage place and a maturation place for sperm. But those two side by side will show you that you'll never be fooled because sometimes you, if you do a histology test, somebody will show you a nice round seminiferous tubule and a round epididymis duct, epididymal duct, but look at how different they are. These are clean, their columnar epithelium and the nuclei of the cell are all near the basement membrane out here where the seminiferous tubule does not look that organized. Neat. And finally, there's where I got some of these illustrations, although Testicular tissue, man, I've got a lot. I got to slide, uh, get some slides in my image databases, but this is what I used here. Thank you.